Before we get started on this episode of Outdoor Adventures with Jason, I wanted to apologize about the audio quality. I was running into a bit of an error or issue with the recording, and fortunately that deterred a little bit from hearing some of the things that Rachel has to say in this episode. But it's really good, so stick with it. She's got a very interesting and great story to tell. Also, please go out and take this time to be very diligent about the legislation that's going on with uh, that will affect our public lands. Those are our public lands, not public lands that we want to be ever sold off. We want them pe- for the people to use and enjoy. Get out there. Join groups like Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and my personal favorite, National Wild Turkey Federation. They're preserving the lands for the benefit of turkeys That land then benefits the other species that live there. So go to nwtf.org, check it out, join. They've always got some neat promotions going on when you get your membership. Thank you and enjoy this episode. Welcome to Outdoor Adventures with Jason. Each week I bring the world of hunting, fishing, and conservation to you. From the great hunting and fishing opportunities found in the Americas to the dream safaris located on the dark continent beyond. I'll introduce you to those who are already out in the field living every outdoor enthusiast's dream, as well as outfitters and gear manufacturers that can make those dreams your reality. Welcome to this week's episode of Outdoor Adventures with Jason. I'm really excited today. I've got just a really neat person on. She's uh, just a very accomplished outdoors woman and and sportsman in her own right. I've got Rachel Attil on. Rachel, how are you doing today? I'm very well, Jason. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast. It's a pleasure to finally connect through all of our different social media channels. Yeah, that's been a, a lot of fun trying to follow your adventures as, as you go through on your Facebook posts and stuff. It's really amazing. Oh, thank you, Jason. And c- congratulations to you with your podcast. I know we're on to, um, you're on to in the mid-20s in your episodes now. That's an exciting time in your career as well. Oh, it's been a lot of fun. I've always been outdoor involved in various ways, generally just hunting. So this is a whole new endeavor and uh, I'm very excited. So thank you. I appreciate it. Rachel, I really want to focus on your background as a hunter and where you've come from. Have you always hunted? Did you grow up in a family that was a a hunting family? Well, to be honest, Jason, um, hunting, my dad used to do it as a kid growing up. They they grew up in southern BC in the Okanagan Valley, and my mom grew up on Vancouver's coast, and they were fishing all the time as kids. But when my parents came together, there was very little hunting, really, but they were big supporters of getting us kids outdoors. We grew up on a property. You know, we were dirt biking, we were camping, we were fishing. But the hunting side really got introduced when I was 10 turning 11. And I was actually the second choice for uh, my godparents. They have a daughter the same age as I. And I got to go north. And by going north, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the geography of British Columbia, but that's the equivalent of driving 24 hours in a car and then flying an hour and a half south in a bush plane. Wow. So the end of the world <laughs> as a child, and I, it would blew my mind because, uh, you know, as you grow up, you start to get an idea for your spatial awareness. And so you think of these distances as these great advantages, and it's like, wow, I'm literally going to the end of the world. <laughs> um, and so from there, I, I was a horse crazy kid, and I got to ride and do trail rides with some of the guides and the wranglers. And then from there, I kept coming back every summer. And I knew what a hunting camp was, and I started to get a feel for it. And, you know, it didn't bother me. I mean, I knew that they were hunting animals, and I got to eat the meat at camp. And to me, that was excellent. It should be having hot dogs back at home. From there, as a wrangler, um, when I was into my early teenage years, we slowly got to trail out with the guys, and our roles and responsibilities kind of evolved. And then when I was in my mid-teens, I was actually able to wrangle on a sheep hunt, which to me it was a huge eye-opener. And then from there, it took off. Like It was one of those moments that all of a sudden I understood where I was meant to be. And my world was just blown up. So from there, I started hunting um, mostly just with the clients and working my way up from wrangler to a guide position. But at that stage, I had guided more animals than I'd actually shot for myself, unless you're going to count like a gopher and a grouse. <laughs> so <laughs> that's there's kind of a saying in the industry, you know, always a guide, never the hunter. So that it kind of comes part and parcel with the territory. So you actually got taken under the wing by these other wranglers, and and really from a young age, you were you were just out there. You were where everybody else was at. Yep, you got it. It you know for the hunting camps in the northwest um, British Columbia, you know it's so far removed. And the camp that I actually went to is kind of infamous in itself with the history. If anyone's a sheep hunter, they know of the Chadwick Ram, they know of Jack O'Connor, and all of his exploits. Scoop like Outfitters is a part of the old history with Scoop Davidson and Pat Cook, and there's just this rich culture 
of history of Packers into that country and, and even Scoop Like itself, you know, through the 60s and 70s when Gordon Eastman had come there. It's been really wild, Jason, because now having the opportunity to look back, I guided my first Stone Sheep client in Gordon Eastman's Valley where he killed his ram for high, wild, and free. Now I'm very honored to be writing for the magazine. So it's kind of one of those goosebump moments where it's like something greater than myself had kind of come together at that stage. So so just through sheer luck, you end up in an area, uh, sheep hunting that's yeah, rich in history. divine intervention, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Wow, so, so you've got these same mountain ranges that Eastman's and O'Connor and, and all these guys traveled and here you are riding and, and wrangling these same areas and guiding through them. Exactly. And, you know, and, and as things do, you know, careers evolve. And I worked my way up the chain and was managing my own camp. And with the idea to, you know, move on, I've had different opportunities to guide in the Yukon, um, Saskatchewan, doing a little bit of white-tailed deer stuff, down into New Zealand, guiding for some of the southern camps on the South Island. And then now back up in the Northwest Territories. You know, it's funny. They say that there was five degrees or six degrees of separation. Now I think with social media and way people connect, there's like 2.2. The hunting community has always been a small, but now it's a very tight-knit, everybody knows everybody through one form or fashion. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, for instance, the guy I guide for now, Harold Grindy, he bought the area in the Northwest Territories off of a gentleman named Bill McKenzie. So Bill McKenzie is good family friends of Scoop Like Outfitters, and Bill McKenzie taught me how to skin elk hides when we were young. And he would tell me all these wild stories of the Northwest Territories and pack horse races. And so now to actually be up there working for Harold, it's, it's come full circle again. So it's, it's pretty neat. That's pretty neat experience. And you know, for anybody who's starting off wanting to be a guide, they really want to, I guess, look at your progression because it's just been always in the right place at the right time with the right people to just teach you the right way to do it. And then you've taken it to the next step. I, I think so. But I think it's also having the courage to take a chance. When I first started guiding, my whole first couple hunts were kind of by accident. I was passing a guide's license, and the older gentleman, who's one of my biggest mentors and supporters, John DeVries, he would sit back at camp and say, ah, you know what, you go after that goat with the client, or you go and do this. And then at the end of the season, he told the elf, he's like, oh, by the way, that was Rachel. So, you know, for any young guide starting out, it's having someone to kind of mentor and hone your skills. Because, yes, you have to be a good hunter, but at the same time, to be a good guide, you have to be a people person. You have someone who may have may not have hunted in those extreme conditions, be removed from technology, have all of these very nomadic skill sets being put on them in a very short period of time. And a lot of people really struggle with the transition. So you very much have to be a a counselor, a support staff, and just a friend to these folks, which I think is the best part of the job. So it it keeps it, it fresh. For sure. Oh, neat. Yeah. Anytime I've had an experience to work with a guide, that's probably one of the neatest things. And and my best was I was in Africa and and the guide that I had there, not only did we look for animals to hunt, but he spent a lot of time teaching me about Africa and the area I was hunting in. And so that was, I take that now many years past and I still look back at that and say, what a neat experience. And that was all because of him. And so mm-hmm. it's somebody like yourself that comes out, you can absolutely make or break a hunt for the for the person. And like you said, you're wearing a ton of different hats. Now going along, you've mentored, you've guided, and you're now a, a full-time guide. Tell me about what you spend a lot of time traveling and, and meeting folks and helping to book hunts and doing uh, different events. But tell me what it's like when you're in camp. What you know, there can't be that many women that are guides up in British Columbia, is there? I have worked as a full-time guide, which was kind of a nine-month-of-the-year project. And from January through till March, you know, I would do trade shows, hosting seminars. Um, women, I work a lot out in uh, the eastern United States for some of their seminars with their Becoming an Outdoors Woman program. And then guiding through New Zealand, coming back for spring there, going up to the NWT because our season starts early, going over and working my way down the province to BC, and then actually going over and doing whitetails a bit when I worked for Jim Shockey. Basically only had my month of December off to go and see family, but I've kind of, I've settled back a little bit more. I I set out with a mission when I came home from living abroad in 2010, and I had the idea that I want to be an outfitter, but I don't have a money tree with $6 million in the backyard, so how can I start with what I have? 
And every outfitter needs clientele. The last thing that any any person wants to do in any business proposition is go to a trade show or a business meeting and have and show up and have no knowledge or no pretense of any of the clients or, or what have you. So what I decided to work with was the no like and trust. When I eventually have a booth at some of these hunting trade shows, you know, past clients that I've either guided for other outfitters or that have attended my seminar now go, oh, I, I remember listening to her three or four years ago. I, that's cool to see you know, this story of her career and how it's unfolded and it creates that no like and trust when someone is spending their hard earned money coming and hunting with me. That's that's something that I would appreciate. And so I took that model and I've just kind of ran with it the last seven years. Uh, what is the name of your outfitting organization? So I, I actually don't own an outfit yet, but I work for Harold Grandy at Gannon River Outfitters. I've worked for Scoop Like Outfitters, Sickeny River, to name a few, but Right now, I'm focusing predominantly with Ghana River Outfitters, and then I, I kind of help a few outfits find um, clients for last-minute hunts. You do keep quite busy, uh, but it's nice that you get a little bit of downtime. What? Uh... <laughs> I think downtime's kind of a loose word, Jason, to be completely honest, but we'll go with it. Okay. Uh, so tell me, uh, you've done incredible hunts. Tell me a little bit about one of them that, that sticks out most in your mind. What was probably your favorite hunt that you've done? For a personal hunt, most recently, I actually, I drew a grizzly tag up in northern BC, and for the first week of the season, I had my boyfriend tag along with me from Montana, and then I ended up driving all the way back down to Edmonton and catching up with my dad, and then my dad came back up with me. And to be honest, coming straight out of a guiding season and trying to hunt for yourself, I had to remember that, you know, this is, that we can't control everything, especially when you're going into an unknown area. It actually, it was very humbling for me because I don't have to deal with any kind of other resident pressure up in the north. Plus territories and going in and hunting with the two major men in my life um, and having all these other faculties come into play like other resident hunters ripping around on quads and the animals going nocturnal it was it was such a mix of emotions of you know trying to, to hunt hard and, and be successful but at the same time remembering that these are the memories that I'm going to be cherishing for a long time to come with both my boyfriend and my dad and so to me that was Probably one of my most successful hunts, even though I didn't tag out on a critter, was just actually spending time with those two gentlemen and, and remembering what hunting is all about. Sure, but, it's the whole experience. Exactly. And this past summer, I actually had an opportunity to hunt a gentleman that his ancestral reign is about three times the age of Canada. We're just celebrating our 150th anniversary as, as a country. And um, I actually had a gentleman of nobility come and hunt with us. He couldn't make it a few years ago because he was at the royal wedding. I mean, I won't hold it against him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's our tough call. Sheep hunt, go to the real wedding. Well, but he actually brought his son out. They were the third hunt of the season with us. And to be completely honest, it was probably one of the best hunts I'd ever had with a client. It was, he was an older gentleman. He was 65. It didn't hold him back any. At the end of the day, he had a smile on his face. And him and his son were there for the whole experience. And so often nowadays with all of the hunter slam this and world domination and people taking recognition for killing all these different animals, which, you know, there, there is a certain amount of accolades that go with it, but it's remembering the hunt as well. And to have a gentleman who had been so successful hunting, but that was there for the main reason of the experience and just be sharing that with his son, it just, it struck a chord in me. Very and neat. yeah, and the, the really cool part, he was 65 years old. He had an old Matthews mission craze and feathers that were traditional fletching on his arrow. And let me tell you, I learned a lot that Robin Hood wasn't just pulling those arrows with one hand and flinging them off his bow because the feathers, they can't be wet. They can't get rubbed. We had to build a little um, styrofoam cup because we were horseback riding. And so you couldn't shoot in the wind in the rain. He crawled in to 50 yards on a ram on our second time approaching this one band of sheep, he made the executive decision not not to fling an arrow because he knew that this this wasn't his ideal situation and the wind he had a really bad crosswind. And to have that gentleman back down off the mountain because we knew we didn't want to go in and spook them and we weren't hunting with a rifle took a lot of um, personal restraint and and just it's just it's such a different experience as a guide because most clients nowadays are so busy that they'll fly in they'll shoot a sheep ah you know what I'll score some extra points with the wife. 
and come home early or I've got a big business meeting. I was counting on leaving early anyways. And so to have a guy that was literally hunting up until the last hour on the last day after we had been successful on two caribou and a sheep, it, it was phenomenal. It was so refreshing. Wow. That's neat to, to, as you said, there's somebody that's there for the experience. And to get, first of all, to get within 50 yards of a sheep is an accomplishment in and of itself. Exactly. You know, and then well, they got 10 by 42 vision. And a lot of people don't understand that. Like their nose is quite phenomenal and their eyesight is second to none. So yeah, it's like us walking around with binoculars on. Exactly. That's exactly right. And Rachel, I know you've been involved with some programs and seminars. One of the seminars that you've helped with is Becoming an Outdoors Woman. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. That was, um, I actually, I did that with a couple ladies out in uh, North Carolina at the Dixie Deer Classic. Um, Beth and I teamed up and they basically take women from any walk of life and they put them in a safe environment on a camp type facility. They run women through, you know, tying lines, getting a fishing line set up, you know, different calibers, putting them through their gun safety course and actually helping women in a very safe environment and a, and a nice learning environment as well. Most women, you know, if they feel like they don't want to bug their husband or they, they want to start out where they feel confident to ask a question without seemingly feeling silly, that program has had great success. And I know it started, shoot, I think almost 20 years ago across the United States and it's working its way up into Canada. It's evolved in its different faculties, but the core value is just introducing women to hunting and fishing in kind of a nice seminar. And and my role in that was, was telling women that, look, I didn't start hunting with my father, you know, or anything traditionally, I learned it myself and now my dad and I hunt together. So kind of showing them that, you know, you don't have to follow a set path empowered quite a few of them. And they would reach out after the trade shows or the seminars and say, you know, you know, how does a woman get involved in the hunting industry from a guide or or even a trail cook standpoint? And so it's, it's helping connect the dots for them and saying, wow, there's different, you know, organizations where they do post job opportunities and and such like that. So it's, it's kind of like the bridging gap and the intro to helping some of these different programs and bringing awareness. As a woman in a, a field that's predominantly men, do you feel like anytime you go out there that you're you're warmly welcomed and accepted into all the areas in the camps? Nowadays, yes. I, I'm very blessed to work with a great team of guys. And, you know, I think earlier on when I first started going to the mountains, it was a little bit more taboo. There were always been women in the camps. There have been women trail cooks. There have been women wranglers. Yukon Bell was one of the first guides up in up in the Yukon and the, the Alaska and the northern BC side. So there's always been a few little pioneers here and there. But nowadays, it's more wildly accepted that women are, you know, doing the traditional guiding role. There's a few young girls that are up and coming in the last couple of years that have helped on the governor sheep tag. But, you know, it's not too long ago that the Western Producer, which is a magazine where traditionally guides and wranglers were hired, ads were put out from outfitters saying looking for camp staff, follow up with this email. And there were a couple cooks that I grew up with up in the north that when they applied for the position, they were told, look, no bathing suits, no short sleeves, no tank tops, no makeup, you know, nothing to make you look attractive as a female because you are going to the mountains and these men are going to be there for four months. So the last thing you want to be seen is this, you know, sexy gal sitting in the kitchen. <laughs> so, you know, it, and it seems like it's so yesteryear, you know, and I was told wearing mascara in hunting camps was, you know, being provocative. And it's like, you know what? <laughs> Half the time that mascara doesn't stay on your face. If you're caught in the wind and you don't use waterproof mascara and it's too much work anyway. So for all the girls out there that want to make, wear makeup and have the time to wear makeup, rock on. Sometimes I do. They're there's, you know, when you're out there, you don't have to be a man. And that's one thing through my career that I've become okay with. It's, I was judged by these women that were, you know, all hair and makeup and they had the time to. But as a guide, my sole focus is making sure that my client is doing well. They're happy. I'm taking care of their needs and I'm there for their safety. And I'm there for them, you know, to help them have a good time. And, and as a team, you make a decision. And it took a while for me to be comfortable enough to go, you know what? And I'm going to wear a mascara because I woke up early to put it on. And it's for me. It makes me feel good. I shouldn't have to neglect the fact that I'm a female. I don't do it every day, to be honest with you, Jason, because I don't have time. Or I just, it's not important. No, I would imagine you're the first one up and the last one to sleep. That's pretty much it. it depending on where you go when it comes to being a guide, um, there's a lot of romanticism about standing on a hill and glassing off in the distance and always finding a ram and packing off a mountain. But in grim reality, you know, you can go long days, long hours, wind and rain and snow and not see anything. And you're up early and, you know, sometimes you're 
you're fortunate enough to have a trail cook and a wrangler to work with you, which helps share the workload. But when I first started, there was just two guides and two clients. So the guides were also cooks. They're also wranglers and we all had to work together. Yeah. Well, you were, you were doing everything and that's, that's really from a learning standpoint, that's trial by fire, I guess is the best way to say it. You're just thrown right in the mix. Yep. You sink or swim. I find nowadays it's hard to find people that will do an honest day's work. The reason I have got started is we didn't have enough guys that would leave the oil patch when we were younger to come and work the season. Because why would they leave their truck? And, you know, they, they had a big position where maybe they were driving and hot shotting and they can make 300 plus dollars a day. Why would they come want to make $75 wrangling or $150 guiding? You know, which is fair enough in the long run, but that's how I was able to get my start is that no one wanted to come and do that. So well, that worked out well for you. <laughs> Well, hopefully so. You know, I, my dad and my mom always told me, if you can pay your bills and you're happy at the end of it, that's a secret to life and never to live with regrets. So, you know, I'm very happy with what I do. There's some days that are harder than others, but that's to be expected in any realm. Sure. So you've proven yourself in the, the guiding factor. You, you put clients on big rams. You've got people that have written very good reviews about you. Now you're a professional writer along with a guide. Uh, tell me a little bit about the, the writing that you do. Oh, thank you. Well, I actually, my writing career first officially began about uh, six years ago when a gentleman named Daniel Burke approached me from Australia. And I'm proud to say that for the last six years, I've been a columnist for Wild Deer and Hunting Adventures. And that has kind of been just in sharing the experience of being a guide. And when I worked for Shockey, you know, learning how to run a camera and filming a TV show and all the different adventures that led to because it's so different um, in the South Pacific. So my writing career kind of started there and I've done a few articles here and there for Mountain Hunter, which is the Guide Outfitter Association magazine out of BC. Outdoor Canada, I've been a part of a few articles and then last year, Eastman's Hunting Journal's approach um, for doing some of their online content and it took off like wildfire and they would we kind of just chit chat back and forth on some of the topics that I felt comfortable, you know, shedding light on. And then from there, I'm actually very proud to say that my first article will be coming out in the journal to do with the Vanguard Camilla um, Weatherby rifle. So it's, it's exciting. You know, it's all those blood, sweat and tears and those experiences have now come together and I'm able to write about them, which is fun. I've enjoyed writing since I was a kid and being able to use that talent in the winter when you're getting excited about going back to the mountains kind of keeps that feel going. Oh, very cool. So now you got to spend some time with, you know, everybody's familiar with Jim Shockey and his outfit. So you actually got to spend time as a guide there? I did. So if you take a step back in time to 2008, I was actually um, one of the young guys who filmed for Jim before then, um, the young Kiwi guy, Matt. Matthew Gibson was actually a wrangler at one of the camps I was guiding at and we became fast friends and fast forward him and Brian Lynchocki became good friends and they were all living in my hometown and we all became you know kind of trade show friends and we went down to SCI for the first time so I went away for a year and then I came back and when I came back I spent my last $150 and I went down to SCI my goal was to guide for as many seasons as I could and Brian tapped me on the shoulder and said well what is it you're trying to do woman and I said I'm trying to find a job and he said well maybe you should come past you know our booth tomorrow and we'll talk. Well, that led into their professionals TV show. Bramlin had been in their first year of production. They were going into their second year and he asked if I would like to be a part and my role was going to be the rookie guide and rookie cameraman for Jim Shockey's a professional. I had never run a camera, Jason, at this point. I knew how to turn one on and I knew how to turn one off and that was the extent of it. And when you have Jim Shockey standing in front of you and he's going, well, you, you won't screw this up, will you? You know, you have the opportunity to come and film for us. We'll look forward to it. But, you know, we have a certain quality that we're looking for it's like your pulse starts going you get the cold clammy hands and you're like gosh what did i sign myself up for um oh i completely from get there, it yeah and to be honest like in canada we we don't have the same stardom that i think a lot of in like in the united states does so i knew who jim shockey was but until you go to these shows and you see the loyal fan base that comes up and, and the TV show side of it, you know, my respect grew for my new role as I learned, you know, the different roles that he'd played within the United States. So, you know, transitioning from rookie guide and cameraman and, and working on the TV show from going from the Vancouver Bear Camp all the way up to the Yukon and helping do the infamous Argo Wrangle with some of their lead guides. <laughs> I tell you what, I got a degree in Argoology. <laughs> I could change a tire on one of those bathtubs pretty quick by the end of the season. From 
there going down to their white tail area and it was a learning experience to say the least coming from a girl that's always had a horse crew and packs in the mountains there are certain things that are easier about Argo but I'm definitely more of a pastoralist where a horse pack string going to the mountains is a little bit more my style well now I have to ask you something I met Jim Shockey mm-hmm. for the first time this year at the Dallas Safari Club show and mm-hmm. I can certainly understand he's standing there talking to you you're kind of going oh man pinch myself I'm talking to Jim Shockey mm-hmm. but I had to ask him and I said my favorite outdoor episodes bar none of somebody's TV show is watching his father and father-in-law Hal and Len mm-hmm. did you ever get a chance to work with them I yes I certainly did the two years that I worked for Jim I um, I got to help film second camera for Hal and Len and sit in the back seat between those two gents and I tell you what they had me in stitches I, I must have done like the ab rip of pro between sitting between two of them their, their advice on life and men it just the best comedians in the world couldn't write that content you know for how proud Hal was of Jim and you know he was always out there in Saskatchewan too when the hunters would come out and the stories he would tell it just they were two legends in the making and they're very much missed by everyone and I think that they brought a very real camaraderie that I think speaks to the rest of the hunting world because they were the original hunters they're two guys that would subsist in time they're out for a good time you know they weren't looking to teach everything Boone and Crockett and the comedic relief that they offered us from our everyday life was just bar none oh the episode that they did that was a takeoff of MTV Cribs and those two talk about their hunting camps (laughs) I haven't laughed so hard those two it was brilliant and it reminds you of uh, for me as a child going to deer camp and the older guys that were there and the bs Mm -hmm. that they would constantly you know spew everywhere and you knew it Mm -hmm. was just a a story but oh god those two guys hal and len had me just in stitches anytime i would see one of their episodes oh yeah no they they were true gems that's to be sure well that's great that you're actually you're part of that history that's a those are episodes that I think the Shockey family should just cherish. And I'm sure they do. Yeah, I'm sure they do. And actually, Eva's new baby girl, Lennon, she's, you know, named her after the uh, the grandparents, which was very sweet. And, uh, you know, it kind of carries on the tradition in a very kind of a new age way, you know, but traditionally as well, passing on the name. So, Well, that's neat. So now you are going to be writing for the Eastman Journal, mm-hmm. which is a uh, just a world revered magazine dealing with different types of hunting your episode's going to be or your new article is going to be on a rifle it is it's actually it's out in stands now um and the article that i wrote is to do with weatherby inc's new vanguard camilla i actually am very honored i was approached a couple of years back to help be a part of that project with their women of weatherby campaign and they had a handful of us ladies that all met up and we went through the different things that we would like to see changed in a rifle to make it this that much easier and that much more natural to shoulder and from there we got to actually go see the rifle go through the machining process we got to go down to headquarters and then we actually got to go put our rifle together and then go on a hog hunt north um just northeast of Paso Robles to me that was fantastic so the article will be about the thought process that went into the Vanguard Camilla now tell me a little bit so you're you're deeply involved with Weatherby then and their, and their rifles what do you normally carry what's your what's your rifle of choice? Well, to be honest, um, when it comes to a hunting rifle for myself, I actually, I carry the 300 Weatherby Mag, but my new favorite rifle that I've just acquired in the last year was the 6.5 300. That, that rifle, ha- it, you know, it outcompetes an ogler. It's probably one of the fastest flattest shooting rifles there is on the market today. Um, for my upcoming sheep hunt that I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be packing that rifle. But for me as a guide, I actually prefer a 45-70 and I carry a hint that, you know, it's a stupid proof lever action that can take an absolute beating but I can get rounds big enough that it gives me the false sense of security that with the 400 grains that you know I might be able to stop something if it, I have to come to that and you're, and it's a lever action you said yeah it's a lever action alright the, the old standby <laughs> the old standby old faithful you know they're easy to clean easy to reload um, they're a nice shorter they're a little bit heavier but you know what it, it sits right underneath my knee and my scabbard off the side of my horse you know a lot of these rifles that have scopes nowadays that the long range is really taking off but regardless if you're a long range shooter the guns are getting heavier because people want to be able to have that recoil absorbed and they want to have these big fancy scopes on it you know the day of a 3 by 9 Burris is no longer happening it, you know I can dial this thing in to see what the animal's thinking which is good but if you're going to be riding in that for 
for three months. It is brutally uncomfortable. Oh, so that's why I choose to stay with leather. You know, I've got the old standby, which I guess is for a lot of the long range shooters out of out of vogue. I just use a three by nine by four, you know, forty. Mm -hmm. That's just I think the old go to scope. But I know you some of these scopes now are monstrous in size, and I can't imagine packing them through the mountains. Well, and that's just it. And you know, with how long the barrels are, I mean, for the most part, the horses that we use are they're big body draft cross heavy horse crossed horses so they can handle it but you know when you get a guy that's got you know a rifle and he's got all his ammunition he's got his day pack you know you got your saddle you got your water bottle you got the big gentleman himself or the lady you know it's just it's a lot of weight and you know your horse will take you so far but you have to be comfortable with carrying your own fire sure and there's a very big misconception with you know sometimes when people book a horseback hunt they think they can ride the horse to the top of the mountain it's like well no not really <laughs> you're gonna have to pack your rifle and, and a bunch of the gear that you've got with you so sheep hunting is still sheep hunting sometimes caribou hunting is worse than sheep hunting because the caribou are on the top of the mountain so it's, you know it's being real about what you can actually carry and pack and are comfortable in the back country regardless of rifle size and scope is that woodland caribou that you go for they're mountain caribou mountain okay so that's one of the three subspecies is it woodland mountain and then just the, t the regular barren. barren barren ground yep yeah i'm not I, I think they're a majestic animal i've never been on a hunt for one i think it would be really neat they actually you know what like, caribou hunting is a lot of fun um they are predictably unpredictable. The one time that you need them to be silly and come walking right in, you know, they decide that they're going to put their tail in the air and run at a dead run the opposite direction. So, and you know, they're like snowflakes. No two caribou are the same with their antler configurations. I think that's one of the really cool parts is it's kind of like a lucky dip. You never know what you're going to see. So what's the best way that people should contact you? So for contacting um, through Instagram, I actually, I have an open Instagram page with a contact button to send an email, um, which is kind of, Instagram has become a new platform that's kind of like a new website. Um, reach out over uh, the Facebook page at Rachel May Attila. Um, I have a new enterprise that's going to be launching come the next two weeks, but I can't at literally say it right now, but well, I'll be able to give you that in like a future show note thing before March. Yeah, so it'll be a new website that's coming out. Do you have um, any website at all right now that you are involved with, Rachel? Not presently. This will be the website that's kind of been in the grand finale behind the scenes working on. So Very cool. So now tell me a little bit and we'll wrap this up here so that you and get back to your day but if you had to pick one fantastic hunt that you just can't wait to do what would be on your bucket list your dream hunt it would be the sheep hunt I, i'm not gonna lie i'm i've been a guide for the last 10 years been going to the mountain for the last 18 and i still have not killed a ram for myself and this year it'll be my second year packing the doll sheep tag for harold as kind of like a, our five-year thank you bonus for working for him for so long and i'm actually i'm going to surprise my dad and ask him if he wants to come with me i'm hoping to tell him before march so I'm going to hopefully he doesn't come and listen to the podcast now and then. <laughs> to me, that that's the ultimate, is sheep hunting. I, it's one of the only species that you can class within a 95 percentile of the age ring so that you're taking a certain caliber of species. And they just there's an elusiveness to them, and they live in such a faraway place. And I don't know if you've ever read any Jack O'Connor, but his famous line is, sheep hunters are romantic, but like the faraway places. And exactly. Until you've stood on a mountain and had the wind blowing in your face and just been humbled by your surroundings and realize how insignificant you are. I just, I can't wait to share that with my dad. And so the first time of the season, I'm really hoping I can pull it together and have both of us out there for that. And are these stone sheep? These actually will be doll sheep. Oh, okay. So they'll be, um, yeah, they're up in the Northwest Territories and they're predominantly dolls, but there's a subspecies that has started working their way up, which is a cross between a stone sheep and a doll sheep called a fanon. And now a fanon only has to have like a small patch of black slash gray merling or hair on them to be considered a doll with usually like a black little tip on a tail. And in the Grand Slam slash Fanog world, you know, to have your four major North American sheep species, a fanon can count as your stone sheep. So oh, for right. me, I would, you know, and it, yeah, and you can enter it as either. So in the last few years, we've seen a lot more fanons up in our area. So, you know, I'm basically going for, you know, an old ram. And if he's fanon, great. If he's not, perfect. I will be more than obliged to, to take a doll. So. And you said your rifle is a 6.5 300? That's correct. That's a real long range shooter, is it not? It is. The 6.5 300 um, rifle, basically what they've gone and done is they've taken all the shooting power. The gun that I'm going to be taking is a Mark V AccuMark with, it's a backcountry composite stock, and basically it has got a sub MOA featuring, so it's known for all the added fe features for the precision shooter. And from there, you know, it's a fluted body, so it, adds, it takes a little bit of the weight. Um, it's basically, I'm trying to think here, 
Nice custom it's build rifle. Well, yeah, it's it's not a custom built rifle. So basically, a six point five three hundred is the fastest shooting rifle that they don't have. But basically, they've made um, they've taken the three hundred, they've necked down the, the bullet, and they've turned it into one of the fastest shooting models. And so your your trajectory, you're not losing any of that kinetic energy. So when you get into the bullet that you want to be using. For myself, I'm probably going to shoot a 165 grain or maybe go into a 180 um, type grain bullet for it. To me, with a sheep, you know, I want to be able to get in as close as I can. But if anything were to go wrong, I think that's where long range comes in, you know, over 400 yards. If you have to do a follow-up shot, even as a guide, you know, for a client or whether you're personal hunting for yourself, if you have a gun that you know I can trust and you know you can hit a small target in the upper ranges between 400 and plus for to the final shot, you can't go wrong. Um, um, and with a trusted name like Weatherby, that, that's what I'll be packing on my personal sheet hunt. Yeah, I was looking up, a, I'll have some links on the website, to the, or the okay. show notes of this episode, for that Weatherby. Perfect. There's some great articles on it, and it's it's actually not a caliber that I'm familiar with, so I can't really talk to it. I know the 6.5 Creedmoor, but this is new to me, mm-hmm. so... I really want to look that up. It, it looks like a fantastic rifle. Yeah, it does. We've got a great rifle. You're doing a sheep hunt for yourself, or at least you're going to have the tag so that when you're out there, if the opportunity presents itself, you'll be able to do it. And yep. even better if you can have your dad along with you. So overall, exactly. what a fantastic uh, opportunity that's going to afford to you and your dad. And as we've said, if you get a sheep, that's just the icing on the cake. It's the experience. It's being there with your father. It's it's the memory that you'll be able to carry along with that. Exactly. And you know what? That's what it's all about. Well, that's what hunting was in the morning ago, and that's what we hope it'll be years from now. So now we can read about your exploits in Eastman's Hunting Journal. Hunting Journal. Okay, I apologize. I'll have a yep. link to that in the show notes as well. And then sometime in the next oh month or so, we'll be able to find out about uh, an upcoming special website for you, as well as okay. uh, we've got information that you've been just instrumental in the Weatherby, and people can reach out to you through Instagram, and you have your Facebook page that people can follow your exploits on and see some unbelievable photos just absolute great hunting photos are out there and just follow you along with what your exploits are i I really appreciate your time i know uh it's always precious to have some time off and and some downtime as you move along and get ready for what i hope is a great sheep season for you well perfect thank you very much jason you know it's a new adventure around the corner and you take these times you got to kind of sit down and catch up on your notes before you take off on the next right oh always well it was a pleasure i can't wait to hear how your your season goes and i can't wait to follow along and see the pictures of of when you put a sheep in the books i think that'll be just an amazing exploit for you an amazing adventure thank you so much jason i look forward to sharing that with you great thank you so much for having me on the show and i look forward to following your podcast well i appreciate it uh it's always a joy i I love talking to canadians and seeing what is going on i really appreciate your time you have a great afternoon you as well you take care thank you Come early spring, it's getting green Fisher on the bed and Hear those turkeys gobble It's ringing in my head The winter rides bass boat Here comes another year Yeah, we command the outdoors around here Oh, we Man, the outdoors Yeah, we Command the outdoors Come summertime We're feeling fine Fishing on the lake Flipping jigs and Carolina rigs From early morning to real late Bonfires on Creek Bank, kick back a couple beers. Yeah, we command the outdoors around here. Yeah, we command the outdoors. Yeah, we command the outdoors. Next year's does until you know winter's on the way. 
Russian blinds and deer stands The fever starts to creep Fill our freezers full of ducks Lots of tender deer Yeah, we command the outdoors around here Yeah, we command the outdoors Yeah, we command the outdoors. So grab your guns and shells, boys. Put on your camouflage. Cause we command the outdoors around here. We command the outdoors.